I ask for a point of personal privilege to introduce Rudd Turnbull this morning uh, because Rudd and I go back as far as the days and moments in which I got hooked into this area of ministry and service. As a young chaplaincy resident in a hospital, they get, got sent against my will by my supervisor over to work at this Center for Di Disorders of Development and Learning, as it was called in Chapel Hill, one of the precursors of the places where I work now, University Centers of Excellence. And I, my supervisor said, we want you to go work a tenth of your time during the whole year there rather than rotate. And I said, what's that? And he said, it's a center that works with families with mentally retarded kids. And I said, classically, I can't do that. Send somebody else. And he said, no, you're the one. And I'd already asked for a huge favor in the program. If you know CPE, I'd ask for the second month off because we were uh, go, had a trip planned overseas, my wife and I, for the first time in our young marriage. Uh, but that being at the Bog Center and listening to families, uh, sitting in observation rooms while their kids were being evaluated by OTs and physical therapists and psychologists and saying, what in God's name is my role as a pastor in this setting? And sort of bumbling and just hearing family stories. Tell me who you are. Tell me who this kid is. And I began then to hear the stories about, um, about their either faith or the lack of any kind of support or response from faith communities. And on the staff at the Diddle, that year it was called the Diddle, uh, the DDDL, the Diddle, uh, was Ann Turnbull. Ann, um, she wasn't Turnbull at that point. I have the, one of my fondest memories is seeing Rudd and Ann literally sort of skipping down the hall one day saying that they had just gotten engaged. Uh, uh, he and I can't skip quite so well these days, uh, but I remember one of those as a, just a beautiful memory. And shortly after they were married, uh, or Rudd, uh, their daughters, uh, and they were telling me a story. They were going to an Episcopal church, I think, at that point. And I, one of my favorite stories was the two daughters were, uh, I think, in the bathtub playing uh, church. They loved to play church. And, uh, and, uh, and so they were just... The, the blessing that you just did about in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And one of the daughters, if I've got this right, Rudd said, what happened to the mommy? Uh, so, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, uh, so, was that you? Maybe, maybe that was you? Okay. And uh, so, uh, I, did, I forgot that you might be here tonight. But sorry about telling your bathtub stories. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but, then since then, those days of that relationship being formed, we have followed each other and, you know, the kind of friend where you don't see each other for two or three years and you meet and pick up the conversation where it just left off. Uh, and uh, Rudd and Ann have gone on to be incredible leaders in the area of intellectual and developmental disabilities, uh, perhaps signif symbolized the most by being uh, asked to form and being granted funding to form the Beach Center on Families and Disabilities um, in, in Lawrence, for, from which they have done so much research. The first words about contributions of people with disabilities came from research that Ann and Rudd were doing where families who were always being asked what are all the problems about having a child with a disability they finally had to say, wait a minute, we're missing some questions here because families were saying and wanted to talk about the contributions that their child were making to their lives and to communities and people whom they knew. The positive contributions uh, was one of the first flips of beginning to be able to see contribution and gift and getting those words into the whole vocabulary uh, that we now are, that's so crucial and that we would so much be bereft without. Um, and so it's uh, just my real deep pleasure to, uh, I've ever since we started the Institute, I've had designs on uh, getting Rudd to come to the Institute 
like my former CPE supervisor, whether he wanted to or not, uh, and, and just to share out of his journey and uh, the ways in which he and Ann loved, cared for, walked beside all of their children and learned from Jay and let him be their teacher and from him taught so many other people about uh, the kinds of supports and services and mostly viewpoint that we need to have as we walk along people and walk, walk along beside others. So I give, it's my great pleasure, Rudd, to introduce Rudd Turnbull this morning. I'm petrified. <laughs> Lord, I, I'm, <clears throat> I'm the best kind of a lawyer. I'm lapsed. I no longer sue, so you can relax about that. Uh, I am an utter and complete neophyte in what I'm about to do. And I'll tell you why that is the case. First of all, I'm supposed to be here speaking about religion. Well, Professor Marty, you will soon learn that I'm not a theologian. I'm the, I just don't have that kind of learning. And second, I'm going to read some poetry that I've written. And I've never written poetry before. And I don't know whether it's any good. I like it. <laughs> I hope that you'll like it. I hope, most of all, that it will have some meaning for you. But uh, golly day, to talk about God and read poetry all in one morning, <laughs> that is enough to make a man petrified. <laughs> um, you know, I've, I've been listening very closely to you all, and here are the themes that I've heard. And of course, I have a hearing impairment. We all get older, and besides which, I sometimes turn people off. But this is what I've heard, and I hope that you hear a little bit from me about what you have been speaking to each other about. And this is in no particular order, but here's a summary access, inclusion, community, friendship, healing, wholeness, faith, difference and disability, grief, anger, struggles, death, telos, heaven, how we describe ourselves, suffering, <coughs> glory, and topsy-turvy. Let me talk about those in my uh, framework. I have to begin by saying something about our son, Jay, Amy's brother. Amy is the older of two sisters, and my wife is, uh, has already been introduced to you. Here's Jay. Uh, he was born with hydrocephalus, which rendered him to have an intellectual disability. That was perfectly obvious the day he was born. Rather than having a concave the fontanelle of his was convex, and you could see this little egg on top of his head. By the time he was 16, he had acquired the diagnosis of autism. By the time he was 17, he speeded things up. Uh, he acquired the diagnosis of having a rapid cycling bipolar uh, condition, and we put a little bit of OCD on top of that, uh, and we have a picture of a young man uh, who is uh, my son. He was an absolutely delightful young man, and he was a frightful horror at the same time. How can that be? Well, he was delightful when he was happy, and when he was not, he was a huge problem. We call it in our business a man with challenging behavior. And let me give you an example of his challenging behavior. When he was 18, it was appropriate for him to move out of our home and into a group home in this little town of Lawrence, Kansas, where we lived. He got there, and after two days, he took all the pictures off the wall. On the third day, he attacked his mattress. Hey, have you ever tried to rip a mattress? Well, he gave it his best shot. It didn't work. The mattress held. The third day, <clears throat> it's kind of like the creation of heaven. <laughs> On the third day, <laughs> On the third day, he attacked the son of the state senator who was married to the uh, pediatrician who raised all the power elite in our little town. And on the fourth day, we began to have conferences and we let, went on and went on and on. And on the last day, we rested and we 
quit a moment before we were fired. And we went home that night and said, my God, we're Martin Luther King Jr. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Free to do what? There was no system for us, we had to quit. And so we created a corporation. I was pretty good at creating 504C1. Uh, one C corporations. I'm going to give you the name of it. I'm not going to give you the acronym. This is a polite company. But here's the name. Full, unadulterated citizenship for kids and youth opposed to unemployment. I figured that was what they were doing to us, and in the spirit of Christian reciprocity, I turned it right around. <laughs> we can laugh about that these days, but it was perfectly horrible, these episodes of choking other people, including his family. I know that Amy and I have had conversations, and Kate and your younger sister and I have conversations about these things. We lived in a home where there was domestic violence. I don't think there's any other way to say it. Um, how did we ultimately uh, resolve this matter? And what was the matter to resolve? The matter was to resolve <clears throat> how to create an enviable life. Now, I don't like the word envy because I've been told I went to a church school back up in New England and, you know, I took my lessons seriously, but I've been told that envy is one of those sins that we simply don't want to have inside ourselves. Well, God, I'm imperfect, and I had this envy, and I had this idea I wanted to have an enviable life for Jay Turnbull, a life that somebody else would want to live if he were Jay Turnbull. And we did not know how to do that. And we made it up <clears throat> as we went along, the, the stories in the book here. But I want to give you a couple of illustrations of how an enviable life came about. And then I want to read to you. 1987 and 1988, Ann and I were Joseph P. Kennedy Public Policy Fellows in Washington, D.C and working in the House of Representatives with Representative Miller from California. I worked in the Senate with Senator Tom Harkin of Iowa. Jay was at Walt Whitman High School. Now this high school was attended by all of the, well, congressmen's children and diplomats' children's and lobbyists' children's and lobbyists' children's and lobbyists' children's. And <laughs> Uh, and they were all headed off to the University of Chicago or lesser schools. <laughs> and they had a football team. And Jay's teacher, who is now one of our colleagues at the university, went to the coach and said, Coach, do you need a manager? Coach said, sure, I need a manager. She said, well, tomorrow morning I'll bring Jay Turnbull along. And they brought Jay Turnbull along. Now, she didn't say one word about special needs. She didn't say a word about special education. She simply said, you need a manager, I'll take a manager. His job was to give out towels to every person who came off the field. So he would follow the team up the field and up down the field, and he would hand out towels. Whether you needed a towel or not, he figured, you, you know, you played. <laughs> You got your two minutes in there, take a towel. Fast forward, football letter banquet. <clears throat> We're sitting in the back of the room. We don't know people in Bethesda. And they call the name of the junior varsity and give them letters. Then they call the name of the varsity. And the first name they call was, you know, Jay Turnbull, assistant manager. Come get your letter. Well, here's this big riser platform and members of Congress and superintendents of education and so on and so forth and most times can you hear me most times the manager the captain you know the coach would reach down and he'd give the letter to the guy standing below <clears throat> no no said jay i'm getting up there and he's 
and to get up on this platform, which was pretty high, the football <coughs> players came and they lifted him up. Oh. And then all of a sudden, the applause broke out and people said, oh, it's that boy. And so Jay's up there, he, he's patting himself on the back. <laughs> like, this is a pretty good deal, you know? He's in the pause, self-positive reinforcement. <laughs> now it's time for him to get down. Forget the ramp, he's gonna get down the same way he went up. So the football players came up and they brought him down. Letters get passed out to other people. It's about time for us to leave. Three women, interesting, Trudity, came up to us. We did not know who they are, never met them before. And they said, we are the mothers of the tri-captains of this team. And our, our boys want Jay to have a letter jacket and he won't get it until April. So they drew lots to see which of our boys would give his letter jacket to Jay Turnbull. He will have a letter jacket on Monday. Now stop and think both in Christian and secular terms, about the meaning of reciprocity, about the meaning of offering yourself, the symbol of yourself, to somebody else. That's inclusion. Time passes, we go back to Lawrence, <clears throat> and Jay becomes a friend with a music therapist, Della. Now Della, Boy, she had charisma. She was a knockout, good-looking, bright, enthusiastic person, and she was a musician, and she was a rocker. During the day, she was the politest little sweet Kansan you would ever want to be. At night, up went the skirt, down tight, bodice, and she got in that. She was in the jazz club, you know, she's rocking. She's got a band called Black Cat Bone. Well, we dropped Jay off at the uh, jazz house where they're playing, 11 o'clock at night, and he goes up and he starts, he, here's Della, and she's playing this number, it's a new number, and Jay loves to dance. So he goes out on the dance floor, he's got splayed feet, and he can't dance, but he can do this. And he's out there dancing. Oh, probably 150 or so patrons, nobody's dancing with him. They're all looking at him, and Della, says, all right, folks, you have just witnessed Lawrence, Kansas' newest dance craze. It's called the JT Shuffle. <laughs> now, I'm going to play it again, and she did, and one by one by one, everybody <laughs> in that bar <laughs> got off. So imagine 151 people <laughs> doing the JT Shuffle. <laughs> Who led that, who led that dance? It was not Della, you know who it was, that the least among them led them all. There's another wonderful story, our next door neighbor, uh, David and Margaret Ann Schwartzberg, loved to entertain. They had two daughters who were the ages of our daughters and it was a Christmas party. And Margaret Ann had put, oh, she was a southerner, and she had put out this beautiful spread of food. And David, being from Wisconsin, was pouring whiskey on beer and wine, and everything was, everything was going along well. And into the, their home came some people from St. Louis. And I must say, they're very sophisticated, and very well educated, and very, very wealthy. Ann and I greet them at the door. Jay interrupts the conversation, turns to Ann and says, don't touch your penis in public. <laughs> and don't talk about touching your penis in public, he adds. <laughs> Whereupon Ann says to the sophisticates, Jay has such good manners. <laughs> <laughs> Turned it right around. Turned it right around. Talk about reversal. I'll tell you one more story. 
Those are stories about inclusion. This is a story in which I argue that the greatest social security that our children can have is not the Social Security Act. It is their friendship networks. Uh, we bought Jay a little home, and it was near a bus stop, and he, uh, his job was to learn how to take the bus to work. He worked at the University of Kansas, and I believe in nepotism. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he learned the bus route. The kid's IQ is 40 on a good day, uh, 44 on a good day, uh, 40 otherwise. We went down to the uh, dispatcher, the bus dispatcher, and took a picture of Jay and all the necessary information on it, kind of like your passport to Lawrence, Kansas. And we said, well, Jay's going to be on the bus and so on and so forth. And everything went smoothly. He always got the right bus until one afternoon he did not get the right bus. <clears throat> he didn't show up at home. We became worried, where's Jay? We called the dispatcher. He said, don't worry. He said, uh, he made a couple of telephone calls, got Jay, took Jay back home. We called the dispatcher and we said, thank you very much. We were so afraid that Jay was lost. And the dispatcher said, Jay was not lost. He was just misplaced. <laughs> now let's go to church. I told you all the other night that I was raised as a high church Episcopalian, high and crazy, certainly crazy <laughs> enough to do this. Uh, Ann was raised as a Southern Methodist, and we ended up in Lawrence, Kansas, as a member of the uh, Plymouth Congregational Church, the second oldest church in Kansas, established by abolitionists who came from Massachusetts. We always took Jay to church, as we did with Amy and Kate. He sat with us in the pew. He didn't go to Sunday school. Jay couldn't read his name if it were written in 10-foot high letters in white paint on a red barn. He could, simply could not read. And you all know the Lord's Prayer. We just said it. And he got to that line that I find is the kingdom and the power and the glory. And he spat out that word power like you would not believe. And the minister, our pastor, 20 rows down, heard it and laughed. Time passes, Jay dies. We go back to church about two weeks after he dies. And a woman in the same pew, whom we had only had a passing acquaintance with, leaned over to us and said, Mr. and Mrs. Turnbull, I have to tell you that I never spoke the Lord's Prayer because I always wanted to hear Jay speak it. That is the power. On high holy days, Jay was, as we said down south, in hog heaven. He loved Christmas. He loved Easter even more. Christmas was a special time for us because at the end of the service, the lights in the church would dim and the ushers would distribute little candles, little votives with it, you know, little. And on the last verse of Silent Night, which is the last hymn we sang, we would light the candle. And the lights are coming down, and we were supposed to hold the candle and sing Silent Night. Gets down to me, and then it goes to Jay, and it goes to Ann. <laughs> 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 Jay, please light the candle. <laughs> now, symbolism escaped him. He was very concerned, however, about safety. <laughs> That same Christmas, or it could have been another Christmas, happened every Christmas, we would drop him off at the uh, beginning of a, a shopping center. Jay did not like to walk very far, so we would leave him at the front of the shopping center, park the car, and then go uh, pick him up. And as we walked into the shopping center one day, the man with Salvation Army bucket came over to us and said, who's that? And I said, that's our son. He said, he opened his wallet and gave me everything that is in it. He did not know about the Salvation Army. He did not know the value of the $8 he made that day at the University of Kansas. He did not understand 
anything about money. He knew everything about giving. That's a short portrayal of the life of Jay Turnbull. You get some sense about access and inclusion and a few other things. I'm going to do something now that, as I said, I've never done before. I may, the words of my mouth and the meditations of my poetry <laughs> be acceptable in thy sight. He died January 7, 2009. Title of the poem, I'm Fine, Waffles. Jay awakes happily and cheerfully. It's his usual time, 7.45. How are you, Jay? Asked Tom, his caregiver. Jay responds, I'm fine. What do you want for breakfast, Jay? Jay answers, waffles. Jay begins his usual routine, out of bed, into the bathroom, sit on the toilet and shut the door. Tom hears the clicking of the latch on the door. All is as normal as it could be. Jay's last words, fine, and waffles. Of course, it's fine. Food's coming. These are the last words of his life. They are words of love and concern, the usual words between best of friends. Reagan, his caregiver, arrives, spends a moment with Tom, and walks to the bathroom to help Jay with his shower. Tom says, uh, tells us, Whenever Reagan arrived, Jay would open the door. We would hear the latch lift and hear him greet her, but we did not hear the latch that day. His last sound on earth, the latch shutting the door. Reagan discovers him, she screams, Tom rushes in. Jay's on the toilet, leaning to his right against the wall. His upper lip is blue. Tom seeks a pulse in his neck and on his wrist. No response, nothing there. He lays down, Jay down, does CPR mouth to mouth. Reagan calls 911. Tom, his efforts to revive Jay having failed, now calls me. Rudd, come fast, Jay is unconscious. He calls Ann, Ann races to his home. I arrive before them. Police cars, ambulances, sirens, flashing lights portend a macabre scene. Upon arriving, I see only his stomach. Medics surround him, blocking my view. He's pale yellow or a sallow white. I know, Jay is dead. Anne arrives, we sit, wait, and we don't say a word. We know. There's chaos. Medics, police, coroners, shock paddles, drip lines, calls to the ER, and Jay lying on the floor outside of his bedroom door. Anne and I, solo in our own thoughts, think the same. Jay will not be alive, but irreversibly comatose. That is not who he is. We turn to each other, our eyes and minds and hearts in union. We speak the proclamation. We cannot bear it. Let him go. This is the end. Now the medics confess we've done all we can. Their efforts are unavailing, as we knew they would be. Such a pronouncement of death, delayed out of duty to, to try to bring life back, stated factually and with some sorrow, announces it's over. Anne and I turn to each other. We have lost him. Jay is dead. It's a few minutes after eight. Anne goes to him, rubs his head, touches his hair, which is the only uncovered part of him. I repeat the ritual. We now pull down the sheet draping him. Jay is blue, intubation still in his mouth. He is nearly unrecognizable, monstrously gagged by technology. We say the Lord's Prayer. Tom and his wife, Laura, stand over us. The police hover nearby, for this is a crime scene. Our mortician friend Larry arrives from the funeral home. Jay now lies on a gurney. Larry removes the tubing. The police will not allow us to do that, nor could I bear to touch him just then. Larry covers him. Our pater, pastor Peter hurries to us from his church. Peter prays for us. And we say the Lord's Prayer. We hold hands. I hear only words. I cannot comprehend the prayer's meaning, for there is but one meaning Jay has left us. 
I watch as Larry wheels Jay out, puts him into a white truck, and takes him from his home, never to return. I go to the windows to watch as Jay is rolled away. I scream again and again, I want my son back. The rest of Jay's home is silent. There would be no sound, only a void, but for my screams. My agony does not stop. It repeats itself over and over again. It is the only life I have, this antidote to shock. Dozens of times, the same pain, the same wailing. Anne weeps deeply, sometimes the cr loud cry of a bereft mother, sometimes the restrained weeping of a brave mother, always a mother in the deepest possible pain. Her hurt can be touched, it is so palpable. We hold each other, we sob together, breathing in Jay's death as we breathed in his life, together in unison as one. There was a celebrate. There was a uh, visitation um, two days later. A funeral. This church was built to by 150 people to accommodate 750. The sanctuary was absolutely full. I was afraid there'd be no room for me. There was then a celebration of his life uh, that night. Uh, 150 friends, close friends, gathered for dinner. The burial was two days later, three days after he died. The burial is somber and brief, and Jay's ashes are in urns, one large one and five miniatures. Peter says a prayer. I ask, Peter, may I say a few words? My wish granted, my voice trembles. I recite the first verse of victory. The strife is over, the battle is done, the victory of life is won. I need no hymnal, I know victory by heart. The three long days of death are done, all glory to the risen sun. The sun has shone on each of us these three days. From Wednesday to Sunday, the Kansas sky has been blue and clear. The moon has been as full as it will be for the next 12 months. Our friend Peggy tells us a Greek legend. It is that angels and the risen spirits dance on the moon. We look to the sky that night. Jay now dances with the angels, once again offering us the light of his life. Here's some thoughts about um, that came to me after uh, Jay died. This is called being whole. Amy affirms, Jay was a whole person. Kate elaborates, to be whole is to have all parts of life. The imperfections coupled with the perfections with the acceptance of that wholeness by oneself and by others. Jay accepted himself as a whole person, and so did many other people. Jay taught us about wholeness, for his wholeness consisted of unconditionally loving himself and others, of not passing judgment based on trait or status, of creating community, a shared togetherness that typified his life and taught us all about being whole. The ability to do, excuse me, the ability to be, not to do. Jay was so limited yet so abundantly gifted. He was an infant written off by physicians in some family, compulsory abandoned to the care of strangers, then centered in a community because in a way he created community. Jay's gifts were not his ability to do but his ability simply to be, 
simply to say, quoting John Denver, come, let me love you. Come, love me again. Or I'll get by with a little help from my friends. Or mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Or kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. So many songs, Jane knew them all. All of these songs were about the largesse of spirit and the gift of self. What more is there to give except Jay? <clears throat> January 26. <clears throat> Anne and I meet with my newly appointed cardiologist. We describe Jay's medical history, his death, and we hear the doctor's lesson about the heart's physiology. His last words confirm our belief and our deepest hopes. Ventricular fibrillation, instant arrest of the heart, instant non-existence. No warning, no pain, nothing. Just instant death. The best way to die, bar none. Death was merciful. Anne and I are relieved for Jay's sake and ours, he has no more worries, no more reasons for his explosions, his depressions. Guiltily, I feel some resent, some relief, and yet my neighbor's words come to me. Job well done, Rudd. Jay did not want you to worry any more, to work any more. His death was a gift to you. Death as a gift? The paradox is too great, and yet there is truth. Death was merciful to him, for he did not suffer, and to us, for we did not have the duty of care that would have attended him and us had he lived longer and become ancient or died otherwise. There is indeed surcease from work and from worry, and yet doubt visits me. Why do I feel so conflicted? And why these convoluted feelings? This is titled The Best Professor. And is a distinguished professor at the university I am as well. Anne and I were but instruments for Jay and his mission. We were only that, simply the means to his life. Jay led us, guided us, and demanded from us. Stubbornly, he refused to have any life except the life that he wanted. Yes, he was our best professor, but he never gave us a course for this final examination, except the one that his sister Kate described it was the lesson about loving and living as he did. But he was more than our best professor. He was, in his way, our creator. He was the person who came to save us, to imbue our lives with meaningfulness, to teach us and to cause us to teach. His teaching was purposeful. Follow me, he said, and you and I will find life together the enviable life. It appears that I've written far more than I can read. <laughs> this is entitled, The Origins of Peace. Where is peace's, peace's source? Is it in my faith about the resurrection of the spirit, in my ob obligatory bow to the duties that attend the business of death, in my daughter's presence, in Anne's strength to persevere, in the physician's reassurance about the manner of death? Is it in the compassion in the presence, of, in the compassion presence of a therapist, now a dear friend? in the faith of a pastor, also a soul intimate friend. Yes, I answer to all of these questions. Peace has multiple sources. 
And perhaps peace comes to me in the company of resignation, in the sense that there is nothing I can do except accept. To accept, however, is nearly to say Jay's death is not objectionable. I cannot say that. It is most objectionable and most horrible. But it is unchangeable, immutable, and complete, and I must submit to it. I still yearn for the massive tears and the physical pain. I know they will come unexpectedly. I know they will frequently, frequently less often. They are becoming strangers. It is time now, I tell myself, to learn how to celebrate Jay's life, to be authentic about his education, to let, let the learning begin, I plead. But learning is hard work and slow to mature. These next two are entitled Dismemberment and Not of Semen Alone. Death dismembers. It takes away part of us. And only memory can put back what is forever gone. And even memory fails to satisfy wholly. For the physical being, the Jay whom I held and kissed and cleaned and comforted, is unobtainable. All of these feelings and thoughts and all of these memories, only a portion of Jay's life, because so much of it remains to be recalled, fail to fill the emptiness that has become me, that threatens to be me. Jay was a member of my body. There was with him a physical intimacy born not just of semen alone, but of 41 years of being his intimate caregiver. His death dismembers. It's not an amputation, which deprives a person of a limb, but it is a disboweling, taking away a vital organ, but leaving me alive. The evidence of heaven. Amy, Kate, Anne, and I have talked about heaven. We asked, what is heaven? Is it God's presence? And what does that mean? Does it mean a community of spirits? It, is it where the earthly body and the person are made whole? If so, it transforms Jay. And I ask, is that what he wants? Is it what we want? Or is it a place where there's only the present, just the pure being, no future, just the eternal presence of God and of loved ones, a conjunction of spirits and a joyful presence. It is a place of light, not of dark, of peace, not of strife. That is how Jay would have it. And that is the message that his apparitions, which, of which there were four, bear. Heaven is what we wish for the departed. It is our imagination of what we want for ourselves. Next one, evidence of the divine. We have had evidence of the divine and proof that there is more than this world in our lives. Anne's mother saw the end and she spoke of it as she lay dying. I'm moving to another plane, she said, and it is pure love. She has been our most reliable source, our agent of comfort. At my father's funeral, Jay sang the last two songs that dad sang to me, The Twelve Days of Christmas. I have to add that it was a parody from Playboy magazine, but <laughs> it nevertheless was The Twelve Days of Christmas. And the, what a scoundrel he was. <laughs> the Twelve Days of Christmas and the Battle Hymn of the Republic. Jay loved Tinker Toys, and he's holding them in his hand at the funeral, at the burial. And Jay takes his Tinker Toys, now shaped like a pipe, for Dad to take to heaven and to smoke with baby Jesus. Jay says, Granddaddy Turnbull is in heaven smoking a pipe with baby Jesus. Not just a pipe, but Jay's pipe for he lays those tinker toys upon dad's grave. 
There were butterflies when Amy and Kate were born, and butterflies at the funerals for Anne's mother and father. These symbols, these understandings, these pipes and butterflies reestablished my faith. The faith, the love of loss, excuse me, the loss of loved ones brings me back to belief and faith and away from the edges of skepticism. Faith now quarrels with darkness and grief abates and then becomes mourning but does not vanish. Now grief is diminished but she is not yet vanquished by faith. The power of faith. There are providential understandings, intimations of the divine in Jay's death. I think about mysteries, God's mysteries, that I cannot understand, and I accept and I move on. It is now, as it has always been, a matter of faith. Divinity, providence, grace, comfort, comforte, strength. These are the words that come to me. They are the words of hope and faith. Faith sustains. She bears us on our back, making bearable the otherwise unbearable. Easter and its promise. On Easter Sunday, the year Jay died, early in the morning, light is just breaking, and I have retreated to his room for sleep. I look to the window, and there behind the gossamer blinds is a shadowed cross, the frame for the windows, and yet a spirit, a presence of Jay and of Christ. Anne and I return to Plymouth Church. The sanctuary is full as it was for Jay's funeral. <coughs> Only one seat is not occupied. It is the one next to us. It is the one that Jay would have sat in. Anne and I envision him conducting the hallelujah choruses and our memories make him present, vital, alive, and they beckon us. Come into joy from sadness, the hymn proclaims. But that joy, that journey to joy is arduous. We sing about the risen Christ and I think, if Christ, then Jay too. Now I can anticipate for the first time joining him again, free of my body and of this life, able to be with him on his and God's terms. And so I believe Jay has risen, but death's sting is still sharp. We close the service as we always do, singing our congregational prayer. Smite death's spreading wave before you. God be with you until we meet again. I wish to smite death, but I cannot. I am so conflicted. I need to smite death, but I want to remember. And I fear that in smiting death, in having a triumph of my life over death, of Jay Turnbull, that I will lose Jay and lose his spirit. And then in the phrase, God be with you till we meet again, I find the assurance that Jay and I will indeed meet again. Grace. <clears throat> I cannot explain Jay's death except by attribution and by reference to my faith. By hearing and speaking the ancient prayer, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Grace, love, and fellowship being with us all, with Jay, and so with Amy and Kate and Anne evermore. I know no other explanation, no other sense-making of Jay's death. I had doubted even as recently as a year before Jay had died. I had asked, do I really believe that there is a God? And now I find the answer, there must be. <clears throat> 
uh, as I wrote these things, and I had no training whatsoever in writing verse. Uh, I, I, I could write a pretty good scholarly article in a book and some laws and briefs and courts, but I had no training in writing any of this. I just sat and came out. I changed the voice that I used. Uh, rather than using the pers first person reflective, I now wrote about myself from afar. In Hanalei, in Hawaii, the, we the waves play music, the same music, every day. He stands ashore listening. Where is Jay's voice? It is silent and not realized. He tries to remember his son's voice, his face, his touch, the events of their inseparable lives, and failing, he hears only the building of the water's crest and its crash. But he sees white veins within the towering blue foam. His memory gathers, builds, compounds like the waves themselves. It rises and then atomizes on the sandy shore of his life. There is no single memory, no single wave independent of all others, just the veins of memory inside the waters of his life, forming, compounding impartably, and then dissolving. We've heard the phrase WWJD. This is entitled WWJW. He has tried to recapture the pain that came with death, but failed. There was a time when pain was all, and then when it was nearly all, and now when it is not even a gossamer Paul. If that is hearing, he has wanted no part of it. Standing in the ocean, the sun setting, the beach empty, he concedes the painlessness, and he finds replacement in the form of a question. What would Jay want? He wonders. And he finds the answer so obvious that until now he could not discern it. Jay would want laughter and music and friends and satisfaction with each day's work all in such surfeit that he was raise his arms to heaven and glorify this life. That is what he must have. That is his way to honor his son. There must be a new quality to his life, one of joy. That is what Jay would want. The second anniversary, two full years have passed to this day. The father and mother breakfast where their son loved to eat, and on the food that was his last word, waffles. It was always waffles, as soft as his son's soul and as sweet as his laugh. They order the same, preserve a corner of each meal, and visit his grave. And against the sharp Kansas wind on the clearest of days, that place the remains of their meal on his cremains. They hold each other bound in memory and give thanks. Today, grief is a stranger, gratitude the intimate one, faith the sustainer, and love the victor. Our father. father-in-law was a big tall gentleman from the deep deep south and whenever we would complain about something such as how hard it was to raise Amy and Kate or for me how hard it was to always obey Anne he said baby it ain't easy <laughs> this was not easy thank you all very much I'll be around throughout the rest of the day Thank you. Wait a minute, Rudd. Would you mind staying up at the front for a few yeah. minutes? Come back. Retrieve or retrieve. Retrieve. Retrie Thank you. You've given us so much this morning uh, for transparency, for honesty, for rendering Jay's life so enviable. 
and for yeah the integrity with which you you share your story and for being petrified i don't know about you all but for being petrified you spoke with clarity lucidity and a tenderness that i really admire thank you very much yeah. Thank you. We, we do have some time for questions and comments, and if you'd be willing to, to talk with us some more, we have some time. And yes, thank you. Lynn's got the microphone back there, and I'll turn it well, to you. Well, I'd like to ask you about how you took care of yourself and your relationship, and how you asked for help. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sweeney. Uh, well, there was all kinds of caretaking. Jay. Uh, required a tremendous amount of support. Uh, Anne was the gleaner. She, she, she had the open door. She gathered in people. It was part of her southern hospitality. I, being a New Englander and New Yorker, was constitutionally unable to do that. <laughs> I didn't understand a word she said during the first two years of our marriage, so I kept saying, yes, dear. And, <laughs> And on this day, I said, yes, dear, but, she said, but is not necessary. Yes, dear, will do just fine. <laughs> I, I was the guy in charge of all the logistics. Uh, she, um, but th there was another part of it, and, and that was the intimate caregiving. Jay did not allow access to parts of his body that needed to be washed um, to anyone except Ann and me. Um, there was making sure that everything was, uh, his shirt was buttoned, you know, at, at work, and he would go to the bathroom and then come out, and his, sometimes his shirt would be tucked in, and you'd see the top white band of his undershorts, you know, so we had to repair that. So, so many little things in the aggregate created the person whom Jay was. So he was always well dressed, we always made sure he was clean. So that kind of caretaking. But the other caretaking was the lying down at night and saying the prayers with him. He would lie down and he had the short version, which I always wanted, please God, give me the short version tonight. <laughs> he had this incredible <laughs> long-term memory and he would bless people whom he knew when he was three years old. And so we had all the, the prayers, which was wonderful. Um, we had, you know, you don't have to be in church, a synagogue or a mosque to pray. Um, how did I find the strength to go on? What choice was there? And not only what choice was there, we had no choice about this, but it was such a blessing to do every little act. Now, the bureaucrats were no blessings, <laughs> I can tell you that. Uh, dealing with the aggression and, and the attacks on his wife, uh, my wife and his daughters and me, those were no fun. Uh, depression, you wouldn't get out of bed for four days and you'd wonder, my God, am I gonna have to get a, uh, a nurse here and put him a, a, an IV in and give him his fluids that way? Those, those were no fun. But A, we had no choice and B, we were bound and determined that we were going to make those people who said Jay failed eat their words. We were going to succeed in ways that they could not even begin to imagine. And finally, we did it because we had faith that this was the right thing to do. This was our mission, as I wrote. This is what we were called to do. And when you have a calling that is part of your body, you damn well do it as best as you can. Well, let's take a break, and I will be here this afternoon. You all have been most thoughtful in your uh, responses. Thank you.